in my bowl I want some sweetness down in my soul I could stand some loving oh so bad I feel so funny and I feel so bad I want a little steam on my clothes you know maybe I could fix things up here oh, so they go What's the matter, Daddy? Come on, save my soul. Drop me a little sugar in my bowl. I ain't fooling. Drop some sugar in my bowl. You've been acting different, I've been told Honey, I want sugar in the bowl And I, I want a little steam on my clothes Maybe we could fix things up around so they'll go and go What's the matter, Daddy? Sentimental sap, that's all What's the use in trying not to fall? I have no will, you made your kill You took advantage of me I'm just like an apple on the bough And you're gonna shake me down somehow So what's the use? You cooked my goose You took advantage of me well, I'm so hot and bothered that I don't know My elbow from my ear I suffer something awful each time you go And much worse when you're near Oh, here am I with all my bridges burned Just a babe in arms where you're concerned So lock the doors and call me yours Cause you took advantage of me
Like an apple on the bow And you're gonna shake me down somehow So what's the use? You cooked my goose You took advantage of me Oh, I'm so hot and bothered That I don't know my elbow from my ear The sub is something awful each time you go And much worse when you're near
of all the trouble I see Life's but a losing gamble to me Cares and woes have got me moaning Every evening I be moaning I'm so tired of crying Oh, and I'm so tired of praying Cares and woes have got me moaning Lord, I spend plenty of days and nights alone with my grief. Lord, I spend plenty of days and nights alone with my grief. Lord, I spend plenty of days and nights alone with my grief. I'm Chris. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're not doing the shaking hands. Totally thing, understandable. But I'm so glad to meet you and yes. excited to uh, excited to learn and get to Absolutely. know you. Mm -hmm. So so you're here in California. Mm -hmm. Now you grew up where in New Mexico? New Mexico, yes. Small town called Las Cruces, southern New Mexico. So it's right on the border of Texas, close to El Paso, and then Juarez and all of that. So. Yeah, and now, so was it music in your house all the time when you were a kid? Tell me about this. Um, yes, but no jazz, actually, because I'm a first-generation American, so both my parents are not from the States. Um, my mother is German, and my dad is from Mozambique, so we grew up with a lot of world music and um, more classical and then just things that were inspired by my parents and their lives. So Fela Kuti and, um, and, and Lady Smith Black Mombazo, things like that, that were more native to my, my dad's part of Africa. And then on my mom's side, a lot of um, folk and classical music and even some rock. They were both in Berlin when, when the wall was up and things like that. So. Yeah, a lot, a big house of lots of music. What yeah, was the, jazz. what's the earliest memory that you have of like m playing or listening or experiencing music? What's your earliest musical memory? I remember <laughs> being in elementary school in our choir there, and we were all so small. They actually had us do a version of Blue Skies, um, and I. I had no idea what jazz was at that time. It was fun and it was playful. So it, it was, it's that kind of um, inspiration. Kept going throughout my, my jazz career, I think that, that playfulness to keep that alive. So I often think about my childhood self in my early days of choir and, and try to bring that. Uh, you didn't really know what jazz was Not back at all. then. So was there a <laughs> epiphany moment where the clouds opened up and was like this, what is this? Yeah. thing called jazz yeah and it was actually really late 2014 so I was probably like 18 or something like that um and I'd been improvising a lot throughout my life but I was raised mostly doing 
So what they do in schools, when you're in choirs, they do a lot of classical music. They want you to learn arias and things like that. So I had that background in classical music, and I think that's where my breast support and my pitch comes from. And then when I was in college only, then I had my, my instructor, Mirabai Daniels, um, who is um, Eddie Daniels' partner, and she is absolutely incredible. And she exposed me to jazz music, and she just told me to listen, listen, listen. And at that point in my life, as a young adult, it was crucial, and it still is, and I'm still working on this, learning how to, as I was saying before, play and have fun and improvise and learning to adapt. That's what jazz is for me, at least. It's it's learning yes. how to adapt. And so at that time in my life, always doing things by the book. Mm -hmm. And these are things that I'm still untraining and unlearning right now, is to not just sing pretty things, not just to be beautiful, but to actually learn how to adapt in a performance situation or just making music. And that's where it's most free. And that's what drew me to jazz, is that sure. it's a very, very free, it's the, it's the most free genre there is. Noticing the days hurrying by When you're in love My, how they fly Blue days, all of them gone Nothing but blue sky From now on
than the legendary Al Jarreau called Andrea Miller a brilliant young singer. Andrea Miller has been a favorite of Southern California jazz audiences for several years, citing among her influences legends like Nancy Wilson, Sarah Vaughn, and Stevie Wonder, Andrea is now making a name for herself on the international jazz scene as well as the national radio airwaves. Aside from her local performance work, Andrea has headlined the Utah Arts Festival, the Salt Lake City Jazz Festival, the Newport Beach Jazz Party, the Jazz de Polanco Festival in Mexico City, Jazz at LACMA in Los Angeles, and the Newport Beach Summer Jazz Series with the Tom Kubis Big Band. She was scheduled to tour Europe, opening for Al Jarreau before his untimely passing in 2017. She's also done recording work with producers David Foster, Quincy Jones, and songwriters Alan and Marilyn Bergman as well as recordings for Disney, Pixar, Paramount Pictures, NBC, ABC, Warner Brothers, and others. Please welcome Andrea Miller to Steamer's Jazz at Jazz. Terrence, look who's here. Andrea Miller, I don't know what side you're on, but you're here and you're beautiful and you're lovely and we've got you finally. <laughs> well, here, here's what here's what I'll start with. And that is just, um, you're not from California, right? From No, born yeah. and okay. raised in Salem, Salem Oregon. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and tell us about your musical journey. Because I just, just yesterday saw you had, or, uh, you had sent us a photo of you and your dad and he's a musician and I didn't know that. So tell us a little bit about your history yeah. of music. Well, um, my dad, Joe Miller, um, uh, he was a band director, he majored in music and both of his parents were also musicians. So my grandparents um, on his side. And he uh, made a living being a band director up until my brother and I, I have one brother, 
um, up until I think maybe we were around three and five or four and six. And then um, he wasn't, in, I guess, earning enough money doing that. So he went into insurance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> selling insurance, um, but never gave up playing. So he played the saxophone, um, and but clarinet was really his his main instrument and mm -hmm. he's just Dixieland clarinet was his thing. Oh, so, huh. um, yeah. So he gave up his music career to kind of support our family. Always told my brother and me to follow our heart and follow our dreams and do what we're good at. And that was music for both my brother and me. Oh, um, what does your brother do? So my brother's a professional musician as well. And also a teacher. He lives in Bend, Oregon and piano is his main gift. Mm -hmm. um he's just brilliant brilliantly talented and uh so my dad never gave up playing the horn though he played in the salem concert band which is um like a volunteer uh orchestra uh in salem oregon and uh always played first chair clarinet and um you know uh always never t told my brother or myself to uh have a backup plan like fully yeah. believed in fully believed in it. And I think because he kind of gave up what he really loved, uh, he, he has been able to watch us do what, what we're doing and, and kind of right. live through. What, and what a great thing that, what a great thing he provided for you, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You and know, he, uh, for me, it's, the funny thing is for me, uh, Jazz was my backup player, so that'll tell you what I started with. <laughs> oh my God. Well, underwater basket weaving? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. So, Andrew, how how'd you end up down here? First of all, how long have you been hitting this circuit as a performer, and um, what brought you down here? Well, um, uh, a scholarship to USC got me down to L.A. Okay. Um, so I've always I've always been a singer um, ever since I was I think five years old. Um, my dad, because he has a, a background in music, um, he told me that I was singing with vibrato and perfectly in tune at age five. So it's mm. just it's just it was I've never known anything else to do or wanted to do anything else ever. Wow. And and so um, I was in a lot of um, talent shows and choir and things things like that growing up. And then I, I got to play Annie when I was, I think, 11 in a pretty big production. And Dr. Myra Brand was in the audience and she uh, is a vocal teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. She was, I think, head of music at Western Oregon State College. And so she came up to me and my mom after the performance and offered to be my voice teacher. Wow. And she said, I I really think that you have something and I would love to be your teacher. I live in Salem. So from age, um, I think 11 and a half to 17, when I graduated high school, I would have private opera lessons every Saturday at her house for all those years. So I grew up doing opera um, and, and then I got accepted to USC on a scholarship for theater um, and I, that's what got me out of Salem and down to LA. And mm -hmm. uh, then I graduated and I realized I did not want to be an actor at all. Not whatsoever. It was not in my blood like, like singing was. So um, I just made the decision. So I, I got a bachelor of fine arts in theater, but I haven't pursued acting at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but I think, I think what we do on stage, uh, Performing is uh, a bit of that. It's not playing a character. It's we're ourself, but but still we're we're presenting in a way. Uh, so mm -hmm. my once I got down to USC and uh, then I then I discovered uh, R and B and uh, I discovered Stevie Wonder and the Isley Brothers and all like my whole musical world just exploded with everything. And then my older brother Aaron was sending me mixtapes. Um, of Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and like I, I wasn't a sheltered child, but I would I just grew up doing opera and ballet and and like didn't go out, out on dates or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I so I was kind of late to the the scene of 
discovering all sorts of other music. So then I did, and but I always grew up listening to jazz because of my dad. So I would listen to um, Benny Goodman and Rhapsody in Blue and um, Errol Garner concert on, by the sea. He would play every weekend. So it was always in my head. And then um, when I was in high school for a birthday present, my parents got me the Linda Ronstadt Nelson Riddle Orchestra mm. three album, uh, right. all standards. And I, I learned all of them. And yeah. it was like practice them in the garage with the door down so it had good acoustics. That, that was a so, that was actually a really important album in the eighties. It, it, oh, re yeah. it reintroduced a lot of people to that music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was done so well. Um, so then um, I did I did a singer songwriter original music for a long time and and pop and R and B. And then I got really 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 burnt out on it about fifteen about fifteen years ago. And I said, okay, now what? I have this opera background. I I can. I just felt like I hit a wall with with R and B and pop and my my own music. I'm not the strongest songwriter, but you know I was giving it a go. And then and then I was just so frustrated with what I should do with. I don't want to say my gift, but what I am put here to do is is what I believe. I it's my only real goal in life is just to be the mm. best thing that I can be and do it in the best way that I can. So I was really frustrated with artistically what to do next. And I had a drama log and I looked in the back of it and it was open mic night tonight at the money tree in Toluca. Oh, Lake. I remember that. The money I remember tree. the money tree. Yeah. This great jazz club. So I think it was like, it was probably 2002 or 2000. Let, let's rephrase that. It was kind of a horrible jazz club, but really yes. great musicians. <laughs> but really great musicians played there. Yeah, it, yeah, it was right. a, that was a high class place for me when I was drinking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was so much fun. So yeah, I great. lived really close. So I thought, okay. And I walked in, and uh, Frank Wilson was on drums. Um, Clarence Robinson was on bass. And I can't, Eddie Olivieri was on piano. Yep. And I walked yep. in and I thought, oh my gosh, okay, this, this feels good. And, and then I, I signed up for the open mic, you know, and I, I signed up with Round Midnight. And okay, if, if people are watching that aren't familiar with that song, it's not a singer's easiest song in the world to, especially if you've never heard them. And, you know, so I remember that they called my name and they said, are you sure you want to sing this? <laughs> it, it was on the the nelson riddle linda ronstadt album right, right. and i learned yeah. yeah so anyway that began the, the past i guess 17 year journey that i've i've mm. I've, I've never looked back on of my mm. world of jazz it took, it took a while for me to get to it um and then once i found it it was like cinderella's slipper it just, yep. I thought, oh, oh, I'm home. This, this is what I, yeah. Someday I'll wake 
When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. In and outside of music, my main goal in life is to be vulnerable and is to get comfortable being, being vulnerable, being vulnerable because I, I think, I never, I never quite said that word, being vulnerable. A lot of our social constructs say that vulnerability is weakness. So a lot of us are conditioned to think that being vulnerable and being emotional is weak. So we, our ego tries to keep us safe and we try to not feel too much or not put ourselves too much out there, take risks because we're afraid. I mean, that's like my life's journey so far has been that exactly, like just learning how to be um, authentic and you can't be authentic without being vulnerable. And yes, there's a big risk. You might get hurt. You might let people in that, you know, um, that aren't good people for you or whatever. Like there's so many things that happen and have happened in my life that I've had to and it really, you know, the things that have happened have made me sometimes want to be like, fine, I won't feel at all. I just won't. That's the solution, right? Is to just not. Tell me about a moment like that. Tell me, go into that because I, I, <laughs> yeah. I can see it in your face. You're like, oh, so tell me, yeah. tell me what that situation was. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's too deep, but. Oh, come I on. Have, let's go there. Let's do it. I have a complicated relationship with men. Sure. Um, it has to do with a lot of things. I, I don't want to get too deep into sure. it, but I'll just, I'll just say that. And I think that it's. We live in a very male dominated world and especially as a black woman living in male dominated, you know, where the culture is mostly white, it can be very, very difficult for people of color to find their voices sure. um, and to come at it in a way that's less like an anger of like, I want to be heard and more from a way of like, this is rawness and I want to be heard. So I'm, I, I try to. I've always come from the way that's very respectful and that, that comes through my performance too, that I'm trying to actually work myself into a place of a little bit more sass, a little bit more drive and it's that aggression that is very, you know, it's, it's so appealing and it's part of performance. Sure. So, um, but anyway, so that complicated relationship with men has just allowed me to see that the answer isn't to shut down in situations where I feel unheard or or used or mistreated or whatever it's really um an opportunity for me to just get even softer get even Beautiful. more raw and even more emotional with things um it's been a really big challenge that's and i scary. don't pretend to have all the answers or have it all down but it's something that you have to you have to work on it's like a muscle if you don't exercise your vulnerability well, you just do the things that make you feel safe all your life. And that's one way to live life. And you'll probably have a great one. But then you might. Uh, my greatest fear is getting to the end of my life and being like, wow, I really played it safe the whole way through. That's not the way. I didn't do anything that, you know, really like shocked me or like took me out. You know what I mean? So there was a period. There's a day last week that I felt so in tune and just bliss. I just felt bliss. And I was at. I was at the ocean and I was eating food with my friend and we were surrounded by other people who were all enjoying the beach and dolphins came and I'd never seen a dolphin that close in the water and it lit it just felt How like close? we were in we were in at the beginning of where the waves hit and they were right at where the waves swelled so they were right there and and I I hadn't felt that much clarity in such a long time. So for me personally, my joy comes from like as cliche as it sounds, nature and being with people that you love and trust and food. And that's 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 as simple as it gets. I mean, that sounds that sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's my idea of heaven right there. Yeah. Sounds like a Disney movie. Yeah, I'm surprised it was you didn't start singing to the dolphins you know, and they I, jump and I, out. <laughs> It was the internal voice that was just <laughs> singing. So yeah, <laughs> there's birds landing on your shoulder. Yeah, I was like, point. you know what? Great. I'm good here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely.
upon my brow Your lips that are cool and sweet Such tenderness lies in their soul My heart forgets to beat The touch of your hands Upon my head The love in your eyes I shine The moment divine The touch of your lips On my The touch of your lips upon my brow Your lips that are cool and sweet Such tenderness lies in their soft caress My heart forgets to repeat The touch of your hands upon my head The love in your eyes they shine The moment divine The touch of your lips on mine Did it do it do it do A boom boom play Da da 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 Such tenderness lies in the soft caress My heart forgets to beat The touch of your hand upon my brow The love in your eyes they shine And now at last the moment divine The touch of your lips Of your lips are 
what I love so much about jazz is is the improvisational element. And there's never there's never like a hit the wall point of well I guess I've tapped out and where else can I, you can con I mean there's you can it's al limited. always room to discover more right. Well, you know I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do like Tony doesn't interrupt. I, I'm <laughs> I was gonna say that for those of you who are not familiar with Andrea. Um, and she's very modest about her, her abilities and her, her talents and her, and uh, her stage presence, but it, it is quite mesmerizing. And every time I've seen her play, anytime she played at Steamers, anytime I've seen her anywhere, the audience is very, very uh, into her and compelled. And, and uh, yeah, the audience loves you. Yeah. The, you're, you know, and, and that, that tells you a lot, you know, and I can tell how you feed off that too. So, you know, cause I, I don't, I'm trying to remember the first time I saw you or where it was. I don't know if it was with Mike or was it with Eddie or I don't remember who it was, but uh, I was like, wow. And being a club owner, he's not used to people loving him. So he really recognized that when they That's <laughs> <loved you. laughs> That's true. Oh, oh, man. So you know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand how the, a lot of the back, um, I guess the back rooms of the music industry work. And so one of the great stories about you is that I know that you got to do this recording for David Foster, for uh, demoing a tune for Celine Dion. And people probably don't realize that, you know, all these all these great songs they hear on the radio from these big artists go through a process from the songwriter to demos to producers. Like it goes through this whole chain. And you mind talking mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was precisely that. It was um, uh, one of the greatest composers we just lost, Ennio Morricone. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the album that was uh, it was called "We All Love Ennio," and he he wanted to handpick artists to do his most famous works, and everybody from Metallica to Celine Dion to just it's just a very wide variety. Uh, and Herbie, Can Herbie Hancock did uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Oh, wow. Uh, a remake of it. Uh -huh. So basically, I think what Morricone wanted specific artists to remake his most famous uh, songs. And one of them was a, a song called Deborah's Theme from Once Upon a Time in America. And it's an instrumental theme. It doesn't have lyrics or really kind of a melody, just kind of an instrumental theme. So uh, Ennio called up uh, Quincy Jones. They're, they're very close, apparently. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, it, let's do a little backup. I had a day job up in LA when I lived there where I worked for a concert promoter, part-time, right out of college. And then um, part-time, like it dwindled down to like one, once a week. And uh, he was representing Ennio at this time. And so he... He's in, in, instrumental, pun intended, uh, to, to the story. So um, Ennio wanted Celine Dion to sing Deborah's theme, and he wanted Quincy Jones to produce it and Alan and Marilyn Bergman to write the lyrics. And so I'm in, and okay, so then he calls me, my, my concert promoter um, employee, or, or employer, called me and said, Hey, Andrea, um, I'm working on this project and for Celine Dion and I've got the Bergmans working on it and Quincy's signed on and Celine is, is requesting a vocal demo. You want to do it? I, I said, oh, so it was the perfect example of being in the right place at the right time. Right. But, but and, and in pretty good company. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Having, having the skill to do it and a good relationship with my employer who um, I've known for so long. And so it was just the perfect little matchup of events right. so um yeah so the next thing i know okay so celine does not read music apparently so she needed to opposite of me like it's very hard if somebody sends me something that they want me to demo and if they don't send me a chart i, I want i need to see the melody it, interesting it's yeah. than listening but but she's a listener she apparently learns by ear so uh next thing i know i'm with the Bergmans, <laughs> Alan and Marilyn. Um, so we, we demoed the tune um, with my friend Stephen Boyd, who I had made an album with during that time at his at his studio, like in Reseda, 
area and the balloon winds are coming over and and they're writing the lyrics and they're having me sing it and then flash forward to then Quincy has to go out of town to an awards event in Atlantic City. So he calls up David Foster and says, will you handle this demo session that I've got to do this weekend? Next thing I know, I'm now at David Foster's studio with the Bergmans again. And um, (laughs) it's just crazy. So I got to do the demo and David played on it. um, And the Bergmans were there. And uh, it was really cool to watch how, how much care they put into every lyric and 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 my my delivery of it they would say oh no no don't enter it no like oh, just you know wait and now come in you know they were kind of conducting the session so it, it that's how it all came about and then um my were you employer, nervous okay the weird okay this is so funny i i'm nervous i was nervous for your show right now tonight <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because I feel so strange just being by myself in my apartment and it's so weird but but this calm comes over you when you're in your element of doing what you really know how to do well right and you know that you do like I've never done this before so I was a little nervous yeah. <laughs> but but that happened I remember thinking that I would be nervous but I wasn't yeah I wasn't. I, I've I'm had so that experience happy. I've had that experience too where sometimes these big heady things are just you're really relaxed because it's like that's like you feel like this is where you're supposed to be and then simple things like you know where i get probably the most nervous is anytime somebody asks me to play at their wedding like <laughs> for, like during during the ceremony i yeah. hate i hate playing please don't ask me i hate playing trumpet at weddings because oh i just i i'm so in my head that one little crack note on some little <laughs> melody is going to be on video for them for the rest of their that's right life. yeah oh, that's right i just yeah. can't i can't shake it i hate that <laughs> i am not yeah. available for weddings guys uh, <laughs> but i i totally but get you that. Have, that's, yeah i get that but what i, I think what i was kind of getting at, and I, of course it goes along with being nervous but this was a, a door opening for you a great opportunity it, at any point during that time, did you doubt your capabilities or your uh, knowing that uh, or think that you may choke or you just knew you're going to hit it? No. Um, I knew the song like the back of my hand. Yep. Um, and um, this is kind of funny. This is this is worth a little side note. Um, so I got invited. So I, I learned the song. I mean, note for note. And I read music. So I knew exactly what every note was. And NEO had had sent a note to everybody that there were to be no uh, melodic changes at all. Like, do not change the melody whatsoever or else it, it's in the it's in the garbage can. You'd have to redo it. And so um, I got invited to the real recording session. It was in Las Vegas. And so Celine's there and Renee, her husband was alive at the time. And now Quincy's back in the picture. So he's Produce, you know, behind the board, and the Bergmans are there, and um, Jerry Hay, uh, he was uh, the musical director for the session, mm-hmm. and all these heavyweights are there, and I'm just a little, little person on the back, in the back, on the couch, you know. So Celine is is singing, and she's singing, and she's singing, and she has a question at one point, and she said, "Is is this the melody?" And she she did. Um, it, it was it was incorrect. It was like from a C down to a D, but it was a C to a C. It was an octave is the way the, the melody was written. And so um, Jerry Hay, like, you know, looked at his chart and said, yep, that's it. It's a C to a D. And and so I knew that there's probably, hundred, well, I don't know, hundreds. I don't know how much money it costs for that session, but right. tens of thousands, tens of thousands for that. Yeah. And who would see and all that. And so they were about to go forward and I, I I said, excuse me. <laughs> the, the whole room turns. <laughs> I said, it's, it's actually an octave. It's an octave. And every you know, everybody said, What? And and the Bergmans knew me, though the Bergmans had my back. And so they said, Are you sure, honey? I said, Yeah, if you look at the original chart, it's an octave, I'm sure of it. And and Jerry Hay was like, Well, that's not what my chart says. And we recorded the orchestra orchestra. So Celine, carry on. And, and 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 then the Bergmans got out the original sheet music and they said, no, she's right. She's right. It's an octave. 
And so, um, so <laughs> back to like, there wasn't a moment that I choked vocally, but there was a moment that I could have choked, you know, it was my responsibility. I felt to, 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 to tell. Good. That's that, good. Yeah. That, yeah. that'd be a very nerve wracking moment. Yeah. But then, oh. um, afterwards, Celine came out and, and, she said, um, she came up to me and she said, thank you for, for, for the demo. I really enjoyed how you sang it because it, it influenced how I sing it. I was like, I, I, mean, I don't know if thanks, thanks, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't know about that, but it was cool. It was, it was, it was that's an great. exciting time. Yeah. Oh, that's
Thank <laughs> you. 